Okay, everybody, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. And tonight, we're excited to host former political prisoners, Eric King, Linda Evans, Laura Whitehorn, and Nicole Kassane, uh, to discuss women fighting back in US prisons and jails. Um, so I'm part of the Firestorm Collective, which is a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective um, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And our collective strives to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also continuing to do a fair number of events like this one online, both because it's um, lovely to be able to connect with folks at a distance and because we know even within our own community, there's lots of people with um, accessibility challenges related to getting to in-person programming. So we do have um, a number of uh, great upcoming virtual events. Um, the schedule actually includes two more conversations in the Rattling the Cages series, which has been um, incredible so far. Uh, you can join us on December 7th for a conversation about becoming politicized in prison. And then at the beginning of January, we are um, wrapping up maybe uh, with a conversation about the importance of oral history projects and reflections on the Rattling the Cages series. Um, so tonight uh, we are using uh, Zoom and uh, this is a webinar format, which means that there's uh, a chat, which you're welcome to use. Uh, but if you have questions for the panelists, which we hope you will, uh, I would encourage you to actually put those into the Q&A tool. Um, the Q&A is good because it allows a place to sort of park questions so they don't get lost in the chat. So please make use of that. And I think we're gonna try and have a little bit of time at the end for audience questions. Okay, um, let's see. So uh, I just wanna kick off with uh, some short bios of the panelists who are here with us tonight. Um, Linda Evans uh, was a anti-imperialist political prisoner for 16 years. And before her imprisonment, she was involved in many organizations, including Students for a Democratic Society, the Weather Underground, and the May 19th Communist Organization. She was captured in 1985 and convicted for her part in the resistance conspiracy case. Her sentence was commuted in 2001, and since her release, she has co-founded All of Us or None, a grassroots civil rights organization of formerly incarcerated people and their families. And she works tirelessly with California Coalition for Women Prisoners, um, the Drop Life Without Parole Coalition, the Immigrant Defense Task Force of North Bay um, Organizing Project in Santa Rosa, and the successful campaign to free Dr. Matulu Shakur. Along with her partner, Eve Goldberg, Linda wrote uh, The Prison Industrial Complex and the Global Economy. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, we've also got uh, Laura Whitehorn, uh, who served almost 15 years in high security federal prisons for her involvement in the anti-imperialist armed actions that culminated in the resistance conspiracy case of the mid-1980s. She was involved in anti-imperialist organizations, including the Weather Underground um, and the May 19th Communist Organization, uh, and rights and aid support groups. Since her release at the turn of the century, she's been involved in a number of causes, including campaigns to free political prisoners and is the co-founder of Release Aging uh, People in Prisons, which we've got a great shirt representing today, um, uh, which is a community-based organization uh, founded and led by formerly incarcerated people and family members. Uh, Lara edited and wrote the introduction for The War Before, The True Life Story of Becoming a Black Panther, Keeping the Faith in Prison and Fighting for Those Left Behind, uh, and wrote the introduction to Victoria Law's wonderful resistance behind bars, the struggles of incarcerated women. She and her partner, the writer Susie Day, uh, participated in a prison labor and academic delegation to Palestine in 2016. Thanks so much for being here, Laura. Um, next up, uh, Nicole Kassane uh, is a dedicated animal rights activist who is sentenced to 21 months at FCI Dublin for animal enterprise terrorism. Since the mid 2000s, she's passionately advocated for animal rights. After a brief hiatus following her release, Nicole has expanded her focus working with local groups on prison abolition and immigrant rights. And alongside her activism, she's also returned to school to further her knowledge and impact. 
And last but not least, we've got Eric, uh, co-editor of Rattling the Cages. Um, Eric's a father, poet, author, and activist. In December 2023, he was released from the Supermax ADX prison after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner for an act of protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, he was held in solitary confinement for years and was met with violence by guards throughout his incarceration. Eric has published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing in My Cell. His sentencing statement is included in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury. Eric now works as a paralegal for the Bread and Roses Legal Center. It's great to be with you here again today, Eric. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off. Uh, it's an incredible group of people with so much history and so many stories, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Here we go. Okay. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone who's with us right now. And to you three, like, thank you so much. This is really, really big. Um, and I just feel so happy to be talking with you. Um, what I want to start with, and we can, I'll start with you, Nicole, and we'll just go down. I'd like to know what, what led you to the actions that led you to prison? What was happening in the world that affected you or what did you feel you had to take a stand against? What was it that led to your incarceration? And Nicole, if you want to start, friend. Yeah. Um, uh, so I guess I don't even know the time that timeline, but I started getting a little bit more active with people in Long Beach in LA and just started doing um demonstrations against BlackRock and kind of continuing with the shock case and kind of getting those um, ties to be severed. And eventually, it I mean, it started before that for me just reading books, but then it got more, I got more active as I got older and I could actually drive to places like Long Beach in LA. Um, I grew up in San Diego, by the way, if anyone. So there wasn't much happening in San Diego. Um, and so I, I drove mostly up there and then um, I think there's always something in me that was like, this isn't enough. This isn't ever going to be enough. And so then it obviously went further along the path. And uh, yeah, it, uh, I think I always knew direct action was the only thing that was actually going to make a difference. And, um, and so I felt that the need needed to be me to do that. So, yeah. Were you inspired by the previous action? Like you mentioned, like the Shack 7, but did the ALF and the ELF, were those things inspiring to you? Or did you just find in you that like, I have to do something because this is like what I need to do? Oh, no, I definitely, like ALF, ELF was like, every book I could read on them, I did. And they were definitely like people that inspired me to be more active. Definitely. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Um, Laura, if you, if you'd like to go, like what inspired your action, like what led to those, those mm -hmm. actions? You know, I've been thinking about that a lot recently <laughs> mm -hmm. because of, um, the United States and Israel's intransigence around, uh, committing total genocide against the people of Palestine. And, but it made me realize, you know, it's sort of like everything, like, um, you know, I now live on stolen Lenny Lenape land, and I was just texting with an old friend of mine about his effort to get involved in land back, and which he's actually doing with Lenape nations in Pennsylvania. And I was remembering when I was a kid, all the sense of unfairness, which, you know, now I realize it was like old settler colonialism. It wasn't just capitalism, but I just hated it. And then uh, getting involved with the Panthers, the Black Panthers in the 60s, sort of it was like a light bulb. And you can see from the fact that I'm putting all these links in the chat, so is Linda, we're kind of wonky, you know. They're all. <laughs> we, part, of, part of being underground was, and part of being in the left was understanding that miseducation is a tool of imperialism. And so we want to like, you know, get in there and learn our own shit. Um, and I tried to do that in school and uh, luckily was able to some and began to understand that there was so much, so much uh, disparity of 
resources and privilege and everything. And then when I met the Black Panthers, I kind of went, oh, duh, it's power. Racism isn't bad ideas. It isn't like, let's unlearn racism. Let's change ourselves. It's a matter of power. And that that's the point. And that's the way that it can be overturned. And so that led me to, I don't know, Linda, I don't know what you would say. We were sort of in the same, we went into it kind of slightly together. We were both in Weatherman around the same time, and we were organizing and trying to, or we were trying to organize white working class people and did for many years, um, but also just felt like there was a power imbalance that had to be pointed out. And then what actually, I mean, that's what led me into the Weather Underground and, you know, armed propaganda there. But then what led me into the period that, that, that gave rise to our case, the resistance conspiracy case, was that the the BLA, the Black Liberation Army, the FALN, the Fuerzas Armadas de Liberación Nacional of Puerto Rico, were both being hunted by the cops. And I was in New York, and the New York Police Department was on the trail. And Asada had been liberated. The Brinks expropriation had happened. Um, there were bombings that the FAL ended and the cops were getting close. And so we started doing actions as like to lead them off the scent to oh. something else. And so, you know, I have to say it was like, I, I'm a great believer that solidarity is not about statements and, you know, T-shirts, even though it's a really cool T-shirt, everyone should get one, but is about what the fuck you do. Oh, nice. Oh my God, Marilyn. <laughs> and, um, oh, Marilyn Buck, our co-defendant, Linda's in mine. Presente. Uh, and so, you know, so that was kind of it. Uh, but I would have to say that it was, you know, Mar Russell Maroon Schultz said to Susie and me and Barbara Zeller when we visited him years ago, he said, you know, rage and testosterone for him, humiliation and testosterone. That's what he said for him and for a lot of the men was being humiliated as a black person over and over again, that sense of powerlessness. And for me, I'd say it was witnessing that, that robbing people of their humanity and subjecting them to any kind of brutality, torture and unfairness. And so fighting back felt exactly like what I needed to do. Amazing. Thank you so much. Linda, would you share your journey that uh, that led you to, to incarceration? Similar and different from Laura. We are, you know, honored to be in the same generation and have shared a lot of experiences with each other. That's wild. Yeah. So um, I grew up in Iowa and was never exposed really even to black people until I left home and uh, went to Michigan State University for about a year or a year and a half. A um, Couple different things happened to me there or at, at that time in my life. One was that I was able to go to Detroit and walk through the inner city of Detroit. And it, it had a profound impact on me, walking on broken glass and seeing how people lived. It was, you know, for a young white girl from Iowa, it was very eye-opening. And at that same time, um, my parents put me in a mental hospital. And I was locked up and paralyzed by Thorazine. I was locked up for about eight weeks, nine weeks, and paralyzed, I think, three times until I could work my way to be able to get rid of it. <laughs> and um, that was the first time I was ever locked up. So as a 21-year-old, that was very radicalizing on a very personal level. And when I got out of the mental hospital and made my way back to the community where 
I was living in East Lansing, I started to get involved in political work. Um, there was a crackdown on the student dorms for drugs, you know, pot and things like that. And they raided all the student dorms and we formed an organization, Students for a Free University. And that was a precursor to Students for a Democratic Society, which was started at Michigan, University of Michigan, and Bill Ayers and Diana Outen were uh, travelers, SDS travelers to Michigan State. And um, we organized an SDS chapter there. And, you know, Michigan State was the center of police training for the Diem regime, the South Vietnamese regime that was allied with the United States. Um, they were... Michigan State University trained the secret police for uh, for Saigon. And at, at that point in time, there were seven different police forces that were active on our campus. So there were a lot of anti-police, anti-repression kinds of activity. And nice. we were able to transform a lot of that into being pro NLF, you know, at support yeah. because of the you know, ROTC was there. We had a, we burned down the ROTC building and like many, like many campuses at that time. And of course, uh, we were very close to Ohio and the Michigan, Michigan, Ohio was a region of SDS and we were seriously impacted by Ohio State, of course. So I think that came a little bit later, but, um, in 1969, I think for me, a very seminal experience was that I traveled to Vietnam and I witnessed what the United States did there, what genocide looked like there. And the fact that, you know, everything was being bombed. I mean, the United States at that point in time was saying, oh, we're only uh, attacking military targets. Well, yeah, they could call them military targets because people's war meant that every place was being defended by the Vietnamese people. Hospitals had militia that were gonna defend them, just like it's happening in Palestine now. Same. And so, you know, I think it's really the, the connections, Laura, that you were drawing, the parallels that you were drawing, I think are really important in terms of the need for us to stand up against genocide and against how the United States is using these weapons of war that are keeping our economy going. I mean, let's, the big picture here, right? So I am really, um, you know, I, I'll stop talking. That's kind of what led me, you know, to take action at, at that time was, was some of those experiences and those conclusions. Yeah. Um, so getting arrested is scary as shit. It is a terrifying situation and going to prison can be very scary. Um, I would like to know what it was like if you were prepared for prison if you knew you were going to be arrested, if you had already done prison support, so you kind of knew what to expect, like, what was it like when you were not only arrested, but like first locked up? What were you feeling or what were you experiencing at that time? Um, Nicole, fire us off. Yeah. Uh, so I did some prisoner support before going in. And then for the most part, I wanted total, when I got involved, I wanted total and an enemy. So like I, for me, that meant like no one knowing how I write hand, like no one knowing how I write, like my handwriting, no one knowing like my address, all like I wanted all this in an enemy. I'm saying it wrong, but yes. And so like when I got arrested, I was, I remember, I still remember the day um, I left the morning of, from my place, went for a jog and knew I was being followed immediately. There's like these three very much like military 
very big men following me, following behind me. And like, I stopped when I was like, when I knew they were following me and I just, as they crossed, they're like, oh, the slow one in front of us. And I was like, oh, they're talking about me. And so I was like, okay. And like, that's when I was like, okay, like something's going to happen. So I get in my car and as soon as I pull out, I see another car pull out and I'm like, okay. So then I like drive to my house and kind of park and I, they park too. And I'm like, okay, something's going to happen. And so then I go up to my place and that's where my, me and my co-defendant were sharing in the same place. And I was like, I'm being followed. Something's happening. Like this is where my point was like, you need to get on the phone where I'm being followed. Like this is more than like normal following. Cause we got followed throughout. Um, yeah. Throughout my stay. And, um, probably 10 minutes later, I, if that, and there was a bang on the door, it was like, we have your arrest warrant, open the door. Um, not even maybe five minutes. And so, um, this, I mean, they come in through the door. There's like, I couldn't even tell you how many, this is in San Pablo in Oakland, California. So they like, this is my, where I was the place I was living at. Um, I had like, and I was on a third story, like apartment complex building. So they come in, um, arrest me and my co-defendant walk us down the apartment complex. And like all of San Pablo is like blocked off except going, I think East or North, sorry. I think North, um, is completely blocked off or sorry, South. So, uh, so it's blocked off. And then I just get whisked away and taken to the, um, downtown Oakland. And yeah, so that's how I was arrested. Was I prepared for it? I mean, how, how can I be prepared for like, you know, it's happening, right? Like you're like, okay, it's going to be a time. Cause you see people following you, but like, I was not prepared for that day. Right. Like I wasn't prepared to like say, oh yeah, today's the day. I just knew they, I, they were following me. Um, had you and, mentally and, like reconciled the fact that like I might go to prison for what I'm doing, like that day will come or oh, is it still like kind of a shock to you? No, I, I'm, yeah, I mentally, I was like, okay, they, like when I was doing the things I was doing, I was like, yeah, this is, it's going to happen when I'm not sure. Um, but I knew it was going to come at some point. Yeah. Damn. Thank you, bro. Yes. Um, I'll be back to you. Uh, <laughs> Laura, if you uh, if you could tell us like what it was like when you were first arrested, were you prepared? Um, what you experienced like when that first happened? Yeah, well, Nicole, while you were talking, I was remembering that at one point I was being interviewed years ago, and I, after I got out of prison, or maybe while I was still in, and I said, you know, I didn't think it was legal to bomb the Capitol. So, you know, I couldn't be very surprised when I was arrested. I had been arrested, and so had Linda, a number of times before. Um, uh, one time we did, I don't know, like a few months in Allegheny County Jail and under house arrest in Pittsburgh for an action. Um, so, and I had visited people in in prison in Walpole in Boston where I had been living before I moved to New York in 77 or something. So nothing about prison itself particularly surprised me. Um, I knew it was overwhelmingly full of black and brown people. Um, I knew kind of what it was like. Getting arrested that day sucked. <laughs> and, um, and I fought and I actually, and this is um, unbelievable, but I think because I'm so little, and this has always been something interesting for me in street fighting, is that cops look at me and they see this, I'm not even five feet tall. And so they look for bigger people. So that gives me some uh, running room. So I actually got out of the FBI car, got out of it, and then they jumped me and, you know, a few times. So, so then I was chained up all day to a chair. And um, the first day was really, really horrible because I was sitting chained up in the FBI office and hearing that the FBI came in. Marilyn and Linda had driven to New York and they were arrested there. And I was just the whole time thinking, please, please don't, don't be arrested. Let's have Marilyn and Linda be in the wind. 
and they came in and gloating. They said, guess who we arrested? So that was that was really shitty. Uh, going to prison, I think anyone who's political should not be surprised if they walk into a prison because it's just like America, you know, I mean, Malcolm X said that, I think he said, if you're black, you were born in prison. And uh, I was in Baltimore City Jail. I did my first five years in Baltimore City Jail and uh, DC Jail. And they looked just like Harlem in New York and Roxbury in, in, uh, in Boston. The thing that was um, surprising to me and I learned it pretty fast, was that and I was held in total solitary and, you know, terrorist, 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 and off limits and do not talk to this person, all that shit. Even with all of that, because I was in Baltimore and DC, I had some kind of social privilege as a white person. And I didn't realize that actually until one time when there was a fight on the floor, a, a, a cop, started to beat a woman and I jumped in and started wailing on the cop and I never got charged with it. <laughs> Afterwards, it occurred to me like a, a while later. So that was kind of, I mean, I think the main thing that that was new to me, or no, it wasn't new to me. Every time I've gone to prison or jail, this has been true, that once the women that I was with found out I was on a political case that was about fighting against the government and fighting in support of oppressed people. I was greeted with so much love and support. Never, ever, ever went without. Um, never lacked for anything, even before I could let people on the outside notice any stuff. And, uh, and the other thing, that did kind of surprise me was how political people were in a city jail who were in because they couldn't pay a $300 bail. And mostly in, in Baltimore city jail, it was sex workers and, and people um, addicted to drugs and maybe selling small amounts. And the awareness that people had of what was going on and how much they wanted me to share with them what I knew and what I had done. So I guess that's it. And, you know, yes, I was a political prisoner. And that, I mean, Susan Rosenberg and I have laughed about this because she's not very big either. And every time we were moved to a new prison, they would have at r and they would have these jumpsuits for us that were like huge. Yeah. And they would say, well, where's Whitehorn? Looking around, you know, where's Rosen? Um, so the whole sense of political prisoners was very, very interesting in there. But I guess the main thing that I would say is that what, what I learned from prison over and over again, because it's a lesson that doesn't come easily if you're brought up in a capitalist society, is the power of collective love and support and strength. And how in Baltimore City Jail, I was the cops had a sign on my cell, do not talk to this person. And the women came right past it and talked to me and towards the sign. I remember when did that happen to us in DC jail too, where the administration tried to tell people we had tried to kill Jesse Jackson to try to get us to be hated by the mostly black, all except for us, pretty much black women in there. And they just didn't believe it. They just didn't. So I guess those are the things I would say. And just the last thing I want to say is that, you know, people think political prisoners go to prison and we get so treated badly. And there are things, there are definitely many things and I'm sure Susan talked about that when she did this about the Lexington High Security Unit and singling us out and telling us there are no political prisoners, we'll write you up if you call yourself. I mean, and you know, reading our, all the extra monitoring and all of that. And I know Daniel McGowan was in a, in a, a CMU, a, a management unit and experienced that. But he also saw how that happened to any Muslim prisoner, anyone from the Middle East. And we also saw how it happened to other women. So we, we just should never kid ourselves that being a political prisoner brings down repression that is in its essence different from the prison system as a whole. It is, it's a, it's a, 
I don't know what the word is, but you know, like when you when you boil off the water of something and you get the essence, it's the essential repression, but it is not different in kind from all those thousands of people who spend years in the hole um, and everything else. It's just an extra added thing because we had the nerve to say, this is imperialism, it's racist, it, and it can be overthrown, not just it should be overthrown, but the thing that they really hated about us is that we said it can be overthrown. Right. Thank you so much. Um, Linda, do you, do you have any recollections or any thoughts about what it felt like when you were first arrested or first put into prison? Like any fears or any thoughts for just what you experienced when that was happening? Linda? I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, I don't know, that day, Marilyn and I had gone and, and we knew we were being followed to Nicole. And we kept trying to throw them off and thinking we had succeeded. And you know, it was a couple day, couple day saga. And it turns out that they ended up having a microphone on our car. So they knew where we were. Um, but they had put it on during the, the journey. And you all were underground at this time? We were. We were underground and um, doing surveillance. And it was actually my birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they just took us down and basically strip searched us in the parking lot. Uh, it was bad and when we got there and found out that everybody else had been arrested also like laura said it just got worse uh i remember the first night that i was locked up in that time when i did you know in prison i it was actually in jail but at the start of it all uh i had a very vivid dream of being on my bicycle and riding my bicycle and going down this hill, coasting down this hill in Austin, Texas, where I had lived. I mean, I could, I knew where it was and everything. So it was that, I don't know, the fleeting freedom <laughs> dream or something. But um, I guess I wouldn't say that I was exactly prepared. We had done some support work with the, um, with what, now has become uh, international cure, Citizens United to Rehabilitate Errants, as they call it. It's a very old fashioned name. It was started by two people, uh, a former nun and a former priest, Charlie and Pauline Sullivan, who uh, worked in Texas and worked against Texas uh, Department of Corrections, which was plantation system at that time, black people working in the fields and uh, continues to this day. There have been some reforms, but they were wiped out. They've been wiped out now. Um, I guess what I would like to say as far as uh, kind of the continuum of prison and things that I learned, I had already been working against the Klan and in Texas through the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee and working in solidarity with the uh, Black Citizens Task Force and the Brown Berets. And those were really important uh, experiences and relationships to me. And when we got arrested, I ended up doing about a couple years, maybe a year and a half in Louisiana and there ran into the fact that there was just absolute segregation in the prisons and people, it was, it was <laughs> very difficult to cross that line because there was no trust. And um, it, it made me also have to really stand up 
and address some of the racist language and racist actions of the other white women. And I was alone. I had no comrades there. So it was very um, important to me to be able to do that and to have the consciousness to do that just during that time that I was there, you know. Um, and I would agree also with Laura about the ways that people took care of each other in prison. And I, I want to say that that That's has been, too. that has been continued and I'll do the segue, I guess, I don't know. Um, in, in CCWP, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, our other slogan is caring collectively for women prisoners. And we have been able to um, provide mutual aid and support for a lot of women inside and then formerly incarcerated women outside. I'll, I'll leave it there because I know we're going to talk more about that. I, I want to say something, Eric, about Linda. Linda did time in New Orleans, parish, New Orleans parish jail or whatever it was in some of the, and, and I did time in Baltimore. So those, those were, those jails are not fit for human beings to live in, nor animals, I will say, and not just because Nicole's on here. Nicole? <laughs> there were no, there were, when we got to the DC jail, there were no spoons. So we had to eat with, uh, you had to take a milk carton throw out the milk and eat with that. There were no clothes to I give. I remember that. In Baltimore City Jail, you would see in December in freezing fucking cold because all the windows on the jail were broken. There were just bars and then garbage bags. Women in hot pants because that's what they had been arrested in because there were no clothes. So the level, and I just, I put in the chat that Linda and I were both in the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee. And Linda, you just reminded me that that was true in Montgomery County Jail too, which is the first jail I was in. I walked in, it was Mother's Day. Everyone was drugged by the by the jail because everyone was mothers and they were so depressed. And the, the, the long table where people were eating, white women here, black women here, and the white women said to me, come on, come on, and we'll give you shampoo and stuff. And I, I said, thank you very much and sat with the black women. And, you know, it was like a little bit of an action, but the, the ways that the, that the jails are set up. And Linda also, um, I'm just gonna say this. I don't, I'm so sorry to be breaking that. Linda is an incredible jailhouse lawyer, which my comrade Mujahid Farid, who started rap with me, who died, in 2018 also was. And I don't think people understand what a jailhouse lawyer is and how much a jailhouse lawyer is motivated by feelings of great love for their fellow incarcerated people. And I don't think that's going to come out. Linda didn't say it. So I just wanted to say it because she brings that to all of her work. And um, I think it's it's also in this period really important because we're not going to necessarily be able to get anything from the federal government or the state, but we can still win because you can still be in your brain a jailhouse lawyer using the system, breaking it apart from the from the bowels. Um, and Linda really taught me how to do that. Yeah, fuck well, yeah! Thanks for, well, thanks thank for bringing that up. Just the other thing, I here we're going. I just wanted to say that the other thing about federal prison, it's international. It is so international. I'm sure, Eric, you've ran into that too. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, all of us, right? It's like people, I mean, the United States has turned itself always into the policeman of the world. And this is one way that it affects individuals. And people are locked up and waiting for detention with no legal services. Uh, it's really, really difficult for people that are waiting there on ice holds. Yes. Um, thank you both so much. So something that gets a lot of attention when spoken about prison to try to dehumanize prisoners is the level of violence inside. People almost fetishized talking about prison violence. The flip side to that coin though, is the relationships we build with people inside and the communities we build. That's something that affects me still today. Um, and so I would like it if you all could talk about 
friendships you formed, bonds you formed, um, special moments with people inside that you shared, things that weren't just the, oh, they got stabbed, but like we we formed a community, those sort of things. Um, so if Nicole, if you'd like to start, please, friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> there are amazing people in prison. And I think this narrative of like bad people go to prison is obviously like, I don't think anybody that's in this Zoom meeting believes that, but there are, there are a lot of people that believe that. And so they're just, there's just some, so many amazing people in prison. And I had a lot of, I don't want to say a lot of friends, but I did, I did have a lot of friends. I mean, friends that would make food for me when it was my birthday and they knew I was vegan and would make stuff specifically for me, which is really amazing. Um, friends, like, I mean, and during commissary, we'd have alternate or rotating items that would then, um, one time it was a dark chocolate bar that would get me a dark chocolate bar. Cause I knew that's what I could have like friends that we shared, you know, really intimate, intimate moments where like they were struggling because, you know, family members were struggling and they couldn't do anything. And like, the thing with the prison system, and I think a lot of people know this, is that you can't you can't touch people in prison. Um, you get a shot, which is basically uh, it. I, I mean, like I don't know how to explain it more. That it, it works against every you. exactly, and it works against your good time. So, like most people are like trying not to get shots because you don't want to get your good time taken away from you. And so, like touching is one of those things. So, like a hug, like any type of way of showing, like people like, I don't know, intimacy is, a, is completely, you know, it's a shot. So like there are moments that you can share that with people. And I don't know. Yeah. I just had a, a lot of amazing friends in there and shared a lot of intimate moments with friends. And, and I mean, maybe it's different in men's prisons, but I feel like in women's, like it was, it wasn't, I don't think I was the only person either, you know, and I think it was something that many people shared with their friend group did you do any activism inside like were you able to like share your views and values or did you try to keep that under wrap i mean i shared my views and my values with the people i was with mm -hmm. but i think i mean i only served 18 months and i know i say that only 18 months but there are uh, people that are serving longer time than me than when i was in D dublin and i think when people understand that you're a short-termer, it's like, don't rattle the cages too much for us that are going to be in here longer. And so like, I understood that. And it's like, I understand it. Like if you have only 18 months and someone has 56 months, they're like, Hey, newcomer, you're going to be in and out of here. Like no, no time. Like just, you know, watch your teas. You know, we have, we had loose weights at FCDI Dublin. So like, keep the loose weights, you know, in there, people would get, sometimes people would bring them back to the unit and like the old, like some people that I call them old timers would be really mad. Cause they're like, we're one of the only prisons that has loose weights. So like knock that out and like put it back because this is what we have and you're going to get us taken away from us and you're only here for six months. So stop. So I feel like, I mean, there are moments you can share with people, but also like I just, I didn't feel like it was my, you know, it wasn't, it's not, it wasn't my place to go in there and be like, let me educate you all on this. I just didn't feel like that was, it wasn't my place to do that. Oh, fair play. Were you in two man cells or were you in a pod or how did they do it at Dublin when you were there? Yeah. So, um, two person cells, they are four person cells. There's two bunk beds on each side. Usually they're three person in a cell, but a majority of the time it's four people in a cell. And then you have a sink and a toilet and like a locker. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and for anyone listening, I want, Nicole diminished it, but 18 months is still 18 months of lost freedom. It is still a serious time. It is still time away from your family. It is not little, it's not small. Um, it sucks. Um, so Laura, uh, I would love to hear about you were inside with a lot of your comrades also, like from things I've read in your interviews. So I'd like to hear about like the friendships, bonds, uh, activism stuff inside just the things you did that that were community based inside prison. Yeah, I mean, 
Nicole, I so appreciate the way you said that, that awareness of the difference in privilege that someone would have if they were in for a short time and a long time. I'm, I really, really appreciate hearing that. Um, I just want to say one thing about women's prison and about prison. I think I should have said this when you asked about anything that's over. I think I learned differently and I, I, I feel traumatized when I read, um, you know, I work with people at Center for Constitutional Rights and, and watch the Abu Ghraib trial and everything. I have a reaction when I see the level of brutality and inhumanity and un fucking believable torture that this country and other and other Western European and Israel do to prisoners and to people in general, to oppressed people. And I remember that feeling in prison of the lack of the right to assert your humanity is the basic thing. Knowing that if you're raped, Oh, you can, you know, and people do. There are cases and we've been working together. I know you two have been working much more on it, I'm sure, around Dublin and all the rapes there. But there are, there are all, and Herman Bell was almost beaten to death in prison. And he can now, once he gets out and recovers, he can sue all of that. That's true. And the suits are important. But that sense in every moment of being in prison that they could do things to you that would destroy you for life in terms of some mental thing or something, or maybe it wouldn't destroy you, but it would certainly, and you have no recourse at that moment. And each of us had those things done to us by men in pat searches where they would do, you can imagine that they're not supposed to do. So I have to say that because all of the solidarity and the fear among women sometimes inside of being involved in resistance, because you know that when you resist, there's a big danger of them coming down on you, whether it's going to the hole or being shipped out. We had a whole rebellion. It was very little when the sentencing commission uh, recommended that the, that the, the punishments for crack and powder cocaine be equalized because the way the sentencing structure worked was so racist uh, and punished crack at such a higher rate than powder cocaine. And there's remember that there were hearings in the Congress and they didn't change them. And so there were rebellions in many of the prisons and there was a rebellion at Dublin and the women just got moved out. And, you know, until we got out, I, Linda, I see Nisi now all the time, but, you know, she was one of my best friends. She got whoop, she got moved out. I didn't. So there's all of that, but I, and I, there are two parts for me and, you know, our comrade Dilcia Pagan just died uh, a few months ago and we had two memorials for her here and um, talking about her and seeing the slides of her once she got out and she was, she was released right uh, before or after Linda, also by Clinton, when all of the Puerto Rican independentista political prisoners got clemency, except for Oscar Lopez, who got out 10 years later. But um, when I was, I, one of my friends, S.B. Martel, asked me to speak at the first memorial. And so I just told stories, Linda, about what we used to do, the Hard Cheese Club. Remember the Hard Cheese Club, which was like, because there were some people like what you're talking about, Nicole, who would come in to do like five months or 10 months, because even though at that point it was also a max, women who were in max were in Dublin, but women with short time or two because it was an FCI. And they would whine about oh, the kind of shampoo they have on commissary doesn't smell very good. Oh, I think my hair's getting dry. And we'd be like, you know, shut the fuck up. But so we didn't say, so we would say under our breath because someone, one of us had had a British friend who said hard, hard cheese, chap. So it was, and Dilcia made me, I still have it, this little block of Swiss cheese made out of clay and it says hard cheese. So, and we, and and uh, Carmen Valentin used to say, what'd she say? Precious memories. When we would have a good time together, we would steal food from the commissary and make quesadillas or something and have a little, and we gave each other enormous support as 
politicals. And we did, we wrote statements together. We did, we put, um, we spoke to, by phone to rallies and stuff like that. So we felt like we had some agency together. But I have to say that some of my most best friendships that I formed in prison then they did happen. I mean, Linda and I have known each other for 500 years, but we became much closer in prison. Um, but like Linda, I see Apple sometimes. My my cellmate, who she's from Kansas City, like Susie. I would mm -hmm. never have known her if we hadn't been in prison together. Um, and we and then in my work now, and Linda's work, I I think is the same is among formerly incarcerated people and family members of incarcerated people. And I have to say, and I'm, I suggested to Josh, I hope you guys do this, Eric, to do one, one of these with Don't the family it. members of political prisoners and let them talk about the shit that they went through um, while we were in prison, how they you know, did this. But the people I work with are a lot formerly incarcerated women from, from New York State, not from the feds, when we go to things that are the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women, then we see our comrades from prison. Those are friendships that last forever because we were up against the state together and we found ways to exist, to resist, to love. Like Nicole said, it was illegal to touch, but we did it. And like after a certain point, they couldn't keep writing us up. I also wanna say that what Nicole described about that cell, that cell was built for one person. The cells in Dublin and other, especially women's federal prisons were built for one person because it was before mass incarceration. And by the time, when I first got to Dublin in 87, 86, 80, either 86 or 87. Remember, Linda, there were two people in a cell built for one. By the time I left in 99, there were four people in that same cell, and it's a tiny cell, and people were doing life sentences, some of them, in a cell with no place to sit, no, you know, so um, there was that. And so all of the conditions work against solidarity, but the solidarity uh, exists anyway. And, you know, I think that's, if you ignore women in prison and you only look at the situation of men, you ignore some, you don't see some really, really creative forms of collective struggle because women, we don't, we're not as big as the guards. You know, we have to use our hearts and our brains and our, which I know the men do too, but we really, have to pool all of that um, to work. So, you know, if you really wanted me to talk about all the friends in prison, we'd be here all night and no one else would get to talk. But that's the strength of rap too, that I know from Linda, I'm sure that that's true. Whenever I, when I came to the Drop Bell Wap um, uh, conference a few years ago, it's like that love is just palpable in all of our resistance and all of our work to try to abolish the system because that's what we need. Freedom is the only cure for the ailings of prison. Thank you so much. Um, to Just for everyone listening to touch on what Laura said a second ago about how if you resist, you get moved and shipped away. I was in prison for 10 years and was at 12 different institutions. Um, they are very quick to move people if you resist. So finding solidarity and friendship with each other is a blessing. Uh, Linda, could you please share with us like moments of friendship, moments of bonds, moments of collectiveness that you experience inside prison? Sure. And um, yeah, I'll just say that in the feds, they have the opportunity to ship you around. It's much less true for women than it is for men because they don't have as many institutions. But that's one of the things that we have noticed um, in following up with the women that were shipped when FCI Dublin closed is they've been shipped all over the Everywhere. United States in all kinds of holding facilities, not prisons, but they're, a lot of them are in MDC, Miami which is a, the Miami Detention Center. It's a high rise prison, 22 stories high. 
or, you know, and they have roof time, <laughs> you know. But Nicole, when you when you talked about the cells, it did something to me too, I have to say. It just kind of brought it back and thinking about just the lack of privacy, the lack of, of dignity. You know, they try to rob you of that. And I found so much pride, you know, in the in the women that I lived with, despite what was going on, that it really, that really helps, you know. Um, when I got to Dublin, I walked into the unit, the living unit, you know, I don't pop unlocked it, and uh, Ida, my cellmate to be, was there, and her cellie had just left, and she knew who I was, and she said, this, this is it, come on. <laughs> and so I was lucky because at that time I lived, you know, Nicole, you'll know, in the wing. And there were only two people in those cells. And so I went straight to a two-person cell. That was, you know, very unusual. But uh, later when I got, you know, in trouble for various things, I got demoted <laughs> to the four-people cell. And... Um, just Ida, of course, became a, a really dear friend of mine. She had a political consciousness already. Uh, she had tried to hijack an airplane to Cuba to free a, a, a black prisoner from the Republic of New Africa. And so, you know, she understood why I was there and I understood kind of why she was there. So we have uh, still to this day, very close friendship and oh. uh, very important to me. And of course the Puerto Ricans being there in prison with them was a tremendous uh, boon. Just it, I don't, I, my experience would have been so different without those friendships because we were close. We just spent a lot of time together and cracked jokes a lot. And of course, I was extremely lucky to be in prison with Laura and Marilyn, my dear co-defendants. And, um, you know, every time I look at one of the quilts I made, I think of the night that we named it, <laughs> sitting in, I think it was your cell, Laura. So uh, those friendships certainly created a different atmosphere than maybe people think about. Um, we, we made friends also through some of the political work that we did and the organizing that we did at Dublin. Mm -hmm. um, we had, we started uh, an organization there. You know, I think that people have to understand it really depends what the administration is like in a particular prison. Who's the warden? Who's the associate warden? You know, every time they come, every time you get a new warden, they want to take something away. It always and, gets worse. Yeah. And so you, you don't have that much to begin with, right? So they just keep taking and taking and taking. I know, I remember when they, at one point we had our own clothes at Dublin. I mean, it's a long time ago. And um, they not only they took the clothes, but then people could have colored underwear. And when they took the colored underwear, that was a really big deal to people. I remember that. So, you know, every every administration does things differently. How did you get and, your own clothes? Was that where they mailed in or did you order them off commissary or how did that work? mailed in? We had a box once a year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I even got quilting fabric. The, I, I only we only had boxes. I think a couple of years by the time maybe three. Um, but yeah, you could get a box with a certain limited number of clothing, you know, etc. A long it's time up. ago. That's right, Laura. But uh, what I wanted to say is yeah. that there at Dublin, um, we were inspired by the organizing that was being done in the New York state prisons by the men, David, who I think David Gilbert is on the, um, on this webinar, not 
a speaker, but <laughs> a participant. And David, with others in the New York State system, um, started doing AIDS counseling and, edu and education. And then at Bedford Hills, Judy Clark and Kathy Boudin and many others, um, Cheryl, uh, formed an organization called PLACE, Pleasant, I'm sorry, called ACE, AIDS Counseling and Education at Bedford Hills. At Dublin, we were inspired by the need, number one, but also by the work that was being done in, the, in those prisons to start an organization called PLACE, Pleasanton AIDS Counseling and Education, because at that time, Dublin was known as FCI Pleasanton. And um, that work was really important in creating bonds amongst women because we were able to go with women when they got an HIV test or got the results from their test. So we were able to give support. We got permission from the administration. We were doing their work. They needed the, the health admin, you know, the health, uh, the clinic should have been doing AIDS education, should have been telling people that they didn't need to be afraid to sit in a chair where somebody had just sat, that they were afraid had HIV. You know, there was no education being done and it was mandated by law. So what ended well, up happening is. is we, you know, fulfilled, uh, filled the gap because people really, really needed to know that they didn't have to be afraid to talk on the telephone after someone. And they didn't need to shun people who were potentially HIV positive. So, you know, there was a big process of education and actually Alison Bechdel, who's a lesbian uh, comic strip artist gave us permission to use some of her comic strips from Dykes to watch out for. And we uh, translated and, you know, pasted, copied and pasted and made a big AIDS education flyer in English and Spanish using her comic strip characters. And we got permission to distribute that to everybody on the compound. But I think you know, some of the most moving experiences that we had were uh, when we brought in the AIDS quilt into FCI Dublin. Again, who, depending on the administration, that would never happen probably today because no. the no. whole question of outside people coming into prisons has been extremely limited, both in the state and the federal systems. So, but then... We did have the AIDS quilt at FCI Dublin. We, as place, organized a showing of it. And, you know, what it made me recognize was that every single person on the compound had been affected by HIV and AIDS, including the cops, including the guards. And that was a very unifying experience for all the people that were inside and all the prisoners and that work was very important um this is kind of off topic but how many phone minutes were you all allowed back then when you were when you were in like per month because you were talking about the commissary changes so i wanted to see if there was other changes too i, don't I honestly don't remember <laughs> We could have 20 people on an approved list. And then, um, you know, I, I wanted to talk a little bit, bit more about Dublin and Nicole to hear more from you too about Dublin, what it was like when you were there, because I think it's important that people know what's going on in the federal system because it's going to get a lot worse. I mean, it, it's terrible now, but it's going to get a lot worse. It only gets worse. Mm -hmm. Like this is horrible. Um, so I have I have three more questions. Um, I want to I want to have a like I don't want to say a comparison, but I would like for just to hear like how Dublin has changed, what it was like for you all in certain ways comparatively to Nicole, 
Um, but I was reading an interview today, and it was an interview that uh, Marilyn and Laura did with Susie, and this was a decade ago or, or 20 years ago. Um, and in the interview, Marilyn was, I forget the question, but her response was basically like, at some points, like, I'm just too pissed to want to interact with people. Like, I don't want to go to the chow hall. I don't want to see these people. Like, I sit in my cell. I have my select friends. And I'm tired of this bullshit. Um, and I thought that was really real. Like, I think people get this idea that if you're political or if you have powerful ethics, that you have to be, like, this grandstanding warrior at all times that can't have feelings. Um, and so I thought that just moved me so much. And so I was wondering if, if you all could just talk about times where, like, it just seemed like too much. Like it seemed like fuck this, um, or it just hurt bad. Like things, things were like you just felt it, and like how then you pulled yourself out or got pulled out by others. Um, Nicole, if if you have experiences, if you like to share, yeah, um, I created a routine for myself immediately. So like, I went to MCC San Diego and I was there for a week. You, it was kind of like um, it's a high rise. It's I mean, I don't know how many floors there are. There's one floor for women and you get to go out once a week. I, mean, I think I was on, the, on a roof Yep, where like the roof opens up and you see blue sky and that's it. Um, and you, like there's that, I think there was basketball hoops, but you don't get basketballs. So it's like, I don't, I don't understand the point of that. I was like, okay, so you just walk, you can walk around in a, basically a rectangle. Um, but I was there for a week and then and then I went to Prump, which is a like a holding place until you get transferred into another place. I then got transferred to SCI Dublin in like, gosh, I lost my th train of thought. Uh, what was your question again? <laughs> was there ever times where it just seemed like too much? And, yeah. and then like, what was that like? And how did you come out of that? Okay. And that's where I got the routine. Thank you. Um, so then I created a routine as soon as I went to Dublin, like as soon as I got hit the ground, I chow or breakfast was five, six 30. Your, um, your count call would basically being at five 30. So you could get up and run into the shower if you wanted to. I heard it immediately at five 30, got dressed six 30, got to chow, like went to breakfast, came back or you had to be back before six 30. Cause every move is on the hour. And so came back, changed 630, would go right to right to the um, rec yard. And I ran. I would run all the, like every single morning. It was my, like every day, every morning, except Saturdays and Sundays, because that's when I got visits, but like ran. And that was like the one thing that I would honestly say saved my, like gave me a lot of tolerance for a lot of things because I, I found my way to like create a, uh, because nobody was getting up at, like no I don't want to say nobody very few people were getting up at 6 30 to go running um and so that was my place like I could I actually had the field to myself a majority of the mornings and that was like beautiful because when you're in a facility with so many people you don't get time to yourself the only time you get to yourself and I'll be very clear is the shower and that's why people a lot of times will take two, three, four showers is because that's the only time you get to yourself. And like, that's, that's it. Um, sometimes you have bunkies that are in their, in their bed all day and that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's how they do their time. And like, but you, that means you don't get time in your room. So like you would do showers or do whatever. So I would find the piece running that gave me more time or more, um, more patience I guess but there are definitely times where I just couldn't stand being around people I didn't want to see their like Claws was a big tv show at the time when I was in and everybody wanted to watch Claws I don't really know what it was about because I never watched it but it was like I can't I don't want to know about it I don't care I just want to go in my room and read like so I would find times and like right this is where you respect your bunkie because at that time there was three of us in the room sometimes there was four you needed to also like respect your your bunkie so the way it worked and I everyone can tell their story but like the way it worked is whoever got in the room or had the room first it's their room so my bunkie was in there for eight years that was her room so like she got same the room. cell same same well I don't want to say the same cell but she was at Dublin okay, for eight years bad. 
So like it could have been the same cell, but I'm not sure, but that was her room and we respected her rules. And so when she would get out, then it would someone else, it was like the next person was in line. That was their room. And so you had to respect the room. Right. So it was like, like most prisons, it's all about respect. And like you give whoever wants the room, their room, you give them respect or you go in there and you read and you're quiet. Like if it's because you don't have that quiet time. So like, I guess what I'm getting at is you, you find it ways to kind of find little bits of peace everywhere in, but yeah, people definitely get to, you know, to the best of you. It's, it's inevitable in a place where there's way too many people in there. Did you have lots of visits? I am very, very, very thankful. I will speak to the earth on that. I was in Dublin, 25, 30 minutes from Oakland, probably 45 minutes from San Francisco. I had visits and I had a partner that visited me every single weekend if they could. So like, yeah, I was very, 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 very thankful and yeah, grateful. Did you guys play games? Did you play Scrabble or uh, Uno or anything? We didn't, we didn't have games. They did not give games. Oh no. So like you, when, when your visits would come, you had, they could bring some money to get the vending machine because they would not give you. So your visits, I think would start, I was just talking to my partner with this 730, I think. And they, I think you would had to be back into your, in the room before, I think it was four o'clock count. I think it was four or five o'clock count. I think it was four. So you had to be back. And so they did not provide lunch for you. They didn't provide anything for you. So like, if you got a visit, you, your visit needed to bring money and they needed to bring dollar bills and fingers crossed that vending machine works because if it didn't, you're not eating at all. Um, and that was it. So you could either sit inside and be heavily watched by guards while they like watched you like talk, move your arm, move your, like they wanted to see like if you were doing signs to each other or you could go outside and sit down and just talk. You I think, outside. well, yeah. So I always went outside always went outside. There was this amazing hemlock tree until one of the wardens came and she said, this place needs to be a prison, not, not a tree. It, she, so she said, take it out. And they took out more trees. She what said, a on a tree. like when I was reading Rebecca's um, account on the book about how there was a tree in the rec yard. No, no trees. They're not trees. I was like, what tree? I was like, I missed a tree. No, there's no trees. Um, but yeah, you, you did not get games, at least not that I remember ever seeing games. No trees in front of the units? No, there were. God. Those willow trees gone. Oh, no willow trees. Definitely no willow trees Ugh. gone. But I do remember there was that sign that says no walking on the grass. And I still have that sign. Yep. I still have that sign. So no grass, but no walking on it in case yep. it should come up through the cracks. Did uh did you two were you able Laura and Linda were you both able to get visits and have people come and see you? Oh yeah, you know um, I was just telling someone recently about there's a man named Ahmed Obafemi who sadly died a few years ago who was a great revolutionary member of the Republic of New Africa and New African People's Organization and a good friend of ours and he visited me. I was in Montgomery County detention center for like three or four months which was hell on earth that place the Is toilet the Texas one? in baltimore outside of oh, baltimore. Okay. Sorry, sorry. and the toilets were out in the middle of the dorm it was just a big room with and there was no no wall no nothing and the guards would come right in so everyone who was in that prison for that jail that lock up for more than a month ended up with all kinds of digestive problems but um he came and visited me there because it was a detention center they had visiting 24 hours a day and he visited me at midnight when he was traveling anyway yeah we got a lot of visits from political prisoners traditions mostly in dublin got more visits something about visits in okay so for all those years i was in all those women's prisons you would go and walk into the visiting room and it was full of women visiting the women. There would be a couple of men. The women were the mothers, the sisters, the friends, bringing the kids, all women. When I got out, when I got off parole, the first thing I did, which it was thanks to Linda that I knew that I could apply to get off parole after five years supervised release, I went to visit Herman Bell 
um, who was at that point, I think, in Eastern Napanak in New York, walk into the visiting room and guess who's in the visiting room? All women. And it was just amazing. It was like, who, who, who supports incarcerated people? I don't know. If you looked at the movement, a lot of times you would think it was men. Nothing personal. Present company excluded. Men are, oh, right. men are people too. But yeah. it was fucking women who support the people who are in person. So for me, you know, and Herman and I have talked about this in particular. Every place I was, I would find some beautiful thing. Like there was a, there would be in that same Montgomery County lockup, which was awful. The light, fluorescent lights on over your bunk all night and all that. There was one little sliver of a window and you could look out and there was a tree that you could see. And I would look at that tree. When I was in Dublin, I remember I was sitting there because there did used to be an outside visiting area. Um, there were, and in the yard too, they were burrowing out. Oh, it's a, it's an army base basically that was, you know, that has persons on it. And it's in the foothills, I guess, sort of between Sacramento and San Francisco. And um, yeah, very close to Oakland, but it's in the, sort of in the country and you could see hills in the distance. So that, but you, like Nicole said, you were just never could be alone. I mean, one time I was kind of glad when I got sent to the hall because I was in a unit in Lexington. Lexington was the worst, Lexington, Kentucky, because I was you were in a, a, a unit with hundreds and hundreds of women and four telephones. We should have said that before when you asked how many calls could we get. It didn't matter because there were only, and the phones were always broken. So there were, what, six phones or four phones for 200 women, something like that. I can't remember the numbers, but really, really for women, the the what was available was terrible. I do want to say, I think in the movement, I'm so glad you're doing this one with the three of us because, because of the overwhelming number of men in prison, a lot of people think about the movement and about people in prison, they picture men. And the incarceration of women is also an act of genocide because the women we were in prison with, black, brown, Mexican, uh, indigenous, they're in prison during their childbearing years, you know, from 20s up to some cases given long sentences now till 80 and 90, but certainly even with shorter sentences. So they either can't have kids or they can't take care of their kids. And the destruction of generations is part of the UN definition of genocide, as if the UN had any meaning anymore after uh, not being able to stop the genocide of Palestine. Um, but that was definitely true. And there were days when I would hear a mother on the phone crying, wailing, because she's talking to her sister who's trying to raise the incarcerated woman's daughter and the daughter has gone missing and they can't find her. And they think maybe her father who sexually abused the mother who's in prison has, you know, that kind of shit. Sometimes you feel like it's, it, it's in the walls, <laughs> that kind of suffering and pain. So there are times like that, but I do have to say, Linda and I were, I, we're lucky because we were together and we were with Carmen and Dilcia and Marilyn and Lucy and Alicia and then Apple and Ida and um, and uh, Hamdia. And I just yeah. want to say one other thing, all the women I just named, when they get out, they're doing something to try to abolish prisons, either directly through the kind of work that Linda and I do or indirectly like Carmen teaching and teaching about it. And, you know, it's sort of like that, that doesn't end. And just the last thing I want to say, the resistance is what kept me going. I think all the time about this moment at Lexington, when we did a, we wouldn't go in for count. We all gathered in the main yard. We were resisting, you know, the next day we all got shipped out and shit. I got, you know, we got a lot, but it was worth it because at that moment, 
when the the sacrosanct moment in the federal system is count. And the fact that we wouldn't go in and they kept saying to us, what's wrong with you? You have to go in for count. You have to go in for count. And we went, ha ha. No. <laughs> and we looked up at the sky and it reminded me of that moment that, that the Attica re rebels talked about when they looked at the night sky for the first time in their sentences and saw stars and realized that they and felt free. So, you know, you carry freedom in your heart at some point. And the kind of resistance we talked about before when Linda talked about the AIDS work or all that, that's what keeps you going when you feel like you can't do it anymore. We carry freedom in our heart. Yes. Um, Linda, so this was a, originally going to be about this question um, about Marilyn um, and our feelings of like hopelessness inside and coming out of it. And so if you have examples of that, I'd still like to hear, but I'd also like to hear some of your visiting stories um, or like what, what visiting or just other stuff inside prison that like maybe we didn't touch on enough that, that you'd like to share. Well, I think what I would like to share, since we don't have that much time left. You got is, all the time you need. Well, <laughs> we'll find I, the time. Anyway, um, Laura uh, talked about the rebellion that happened at Dublin. You know, it was relatively small compared to what the men were doing, which was burning down administration buildings and on their prison at their prisons. But people did get shipped out. I think the most important thing that happened uh, from that time is that a couple of the women who were, you know, labeled as the organizers of what happened. I mean, some fires were set and we were out at midnight, which was fun, but uh, they were, they got rounded up the next day and some of them were put in FCI in, uh, I'm sorry, FDC Dublin, which was the men's holding facility. Oh no. And the guards opened up the cell that the women were in for money and they were raped. No. Oh yeah. And so as a consequence of that, um, those women ultimately got out and got some settlement, but it was the beginning. Oh, I don't think it really was the beginning, but it was um, one of the milestones, let's say, in Dublin's history of sexual abuse. And I, you know, Nicole, you were there even more recently. So I think you probably can talk to some of those specific guards. But I believe eight of them now have been convicted and of sexual abuse. Including the warden. Including, I mean, Nicole, if you want to say something, the one that got me the most, I have to say, is one of them was a chaplain. Mm -hmm. A chaplain. And if you understand prison where you're in a long time, a lot of people get, that's how they survive is religion, is their faith. And particularly at Dublin, I will say that young Latin American women were extremely religious and freaked out because they were away from their country, away from their family. They were not speaking English. And the only place they had refuge was the chapel. Mm -hmm. And so I can only imagine the praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, the predator that was the chaplain. Mm -hmm. And he's been convicted. But Nicole, I'm sorry, you, you have more information, I'm sure. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I was not surprised when I saw it being exposed. Um, while I was inside, there was three wardens, I believe. The first warden left before I even got there. So that we didn't have a warden for like a couple of weeks until the second warden came in. She came in and she was there the majority of the time I was there. And then right when I was leaving, she was leaving as well. So then there was going to be a third one, which I would believe was the guy that came in, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, not thankfully, but like he came in and, um, 
One of so the people, people convicted was also a warden. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's where the thankfully he got convicted. Uh, but um, all of, I mean, a lot of the people I, when I first read, it, I was reading names and I was like, what about this? The biggest person for me was my unit manager, not my unit manager. It was a counselor, which was Daryl Smith. Um, he was the worst in, in mine. He was, and I was in unit E. He was my counselor in unit E. So I, if I remember correctly, it was unit, you had a unit manager and then you had a counselor. He was, for when I first got there, he was never there. And like, just so everyone knows, you have to either see your unit manager or your counselor to get your um, visits to get the visit papers and to um, also get your unit number or like your number. So you can like, if you are, most of the times you get them at like NCCs or holding facilities that then ship you there. But like, if you're a self surrender, you have to go to those people to get the number so you can then get money on your books or get a phone call or any of that. They were never there, but he was <laughs> definitely never there. And um, finally, when he did come in, cause everyone was like, Ooh, you're in Smith's. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, just watch out. He has a type and he likes him young and he likes him Latina. And I was just like, I don't understand what that means. And they're like, just watch out. And so he was, I mean, he would come in and like, he did like, you, I'm sure you all see his picture. He would make smirks. He would definitely um, look in your room. Most of the time for privacy, you don't get privacy, but people found ways to make privacy, right? You put pads in your window if you're going to the bathroom or you put pads in your window if you're changing um, Dublin had blinds or not blinds curtains. Eventually when I was leaving, they took them out. So people could actually see into your units, which Priya, if nobody knows is the prison rape elimination act. And so it's like, that's what ever, ever it gets touted about. Like, Oh, if you're having an issue, call Priya. It doesn't do anything. Um, and so like, he would always like peek in your things that there was at one point, like we had longer shower curtains, I don't know who implemented it. Someone implemented it to shorter shower curtains and he would make his rounds more often. He'd walk around more often. And you're just like, there was one time, like you, everyone knew. So he was like, just something was wrong. And I mean, like, you're just like, something is wrong with this guy. And then I just remember there was an incident where a person, and I don't know if she ever came forward, but a person was like, I'm done. Like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. And she was shipped immediately. The next day she was shipped and he was walking around the unit smiling the whole day when she was shipped and put in tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, the chaplain, the chaplain, he was like, I, yeah, he would, he never made himself a, like I, he, knew, he would walk around the chaplain. I didn't go to church all that often or go into the area that often, but when I would, cause they would have like very limited classes but I would go in and like meditate and certain things and like he'd kind of check in and then walk away um but there's people like there's a CMS which was like another another guy that was in there because as far as I knew there weren't cameras in a lot of places and so like the CMS was one of the guys that got caught too and that's where that was happening in commissary that's where the other guy got caught um doing it in the commissary truck um, it was just, there are a lot of places that they, everybody knew. And I guess that's where I'm getting at. Everybody knew what was happening there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was guards. I remember one of the people I was there when I first got there, she got a job in the kitchen and I still know this guard. His name is O'Connor or Connor. And he cornered her in the kitchen and said, I can do whatever I want to you right now. And no one will ever believe you. He didn't get called out yet. So do I believe he probably did that? Probably. He knew he could get away with it like that. And that was like my, I was never going to like, I was like, I'll stay away from the kitchen as much as I have to. I mean, but every single guard knew what was happening there. Yeah. Every single guard, the warden knew everybody like to be like, oh my God, this is, doesn't happen. Yes. It happens at every single prison. Absolutely. And the fact that people are like, oh, this is just a rare incident. No, it is not. It is not a rare incident. Every single guard knew what they were doing. Every single guard knew what was happening. There was another guard that put money on girls' books and they were, he was getting caught. He got to, he said, I'm done with Dublin, went to another federal government facility and got caught because he was, I forget what they called the video streaming system was to, you could video stream with people. He got caught because he was doing it with multiple people. Oh my and God. He got, uh, he had multiple people on the books. 
that's the only re- and he didn't even get caught like nothing happened to me he just they were like oh they were pulling in the girls like did anything happen to you and they're like no nothing because they didn't want to get chipped right because yes. just let's remind this too fci dublin is the only federal facility low for women on the west coast but so now like it's closed now it's closed exactly yeah. and it's like people that have family from anywhere in california like it was a little bit closer but what now happened- it's been oh sorry you're good Okay. I just wanted to tell, yeah, I wanted to tell people what happened there was that um, actually some lawyers who had uh, clients that were facing deportation during COVID were trying to get access to their clients and they couldn't get into Dublin. They kept trying, kept trying. When they finally got in, they found out that the guards weren't wearing masks, which was required on all federal property at that time. And there was a massive outbreak of COVID. Over 200 people got sick because of the violations of that. And, but the, these lawyers are so determined and they were so amazing in that they did not just speak up for their clients they took on a class action lawsuit. And it's the process of that class action lawsuit, which is going to go to to uh, trial in the spring of 2025. And these individual convictions of, P- of the guards that led to something unprecedented, never happened in the history of the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Number one, a judge came to the prison and spent the entire day. Just anybody could walk up to her and talk to her for however long they wanted. And that was the judge in the class action lawsuit. So she saw firsthand the conditions in the prison and women told her all kinds of information not just about sexual abuse, but about medical conditions, about dental, mental health care, their cases. They could tell her anything. She came back to the courtroom and appointed a special master to oversee FCI Dublin. Never has happened before. And that special master was tasked with reviewing everybody's case to find out because they had been stealing people's good time. I know you guys know about that. And, uh, you know, people should have been released. There were issues with, you know, the way that the COVID quarantines fucked up people's release dates, all kinds of stuff. So she, the special master, was tasked with reviewing everybody's case, hearing all their complaints. Five days later, Dublin was closed because they did not want, the Bureau of Prisons will not tolerate oversight. And they still have not responded to a Judiciary Committee letter from the Senate Judiciary that was signed on by 18 uh, representatives and senators requesting specific information, you know, because Colette Peters, the head of the Bureau of Prisons, lied like a just lied through her face about, oh yes, the closing of FCI Dublin was planned for many weeks. (laughs) I mean, really, five days after the special master was appointed, you're gonna try to tell that? And of course, the women from Dublin scattered everywhere. So any family ties that they had built amongst each other were separate, were blown to shit. And their family ties with people that were visiting them were blown because they were mostly east of the Mississippi. And they are treated like shit everywhere they go. They are demonized by the guards. So they'll get to the chow line and suddenly there's no main dish left because the cops have taken it because the Dublin women got released for chow. So, you know, they're being discriminated against really seriously and their, you know, their cases never got reviewed. So 
probably a lot of them should be released anyway. But the, the saga of SCI Dublin will continue and that class action lawsuit is going to trial in the spring. Thank you all so much. Thank you for just letting me be here and hear, hear your stories and experiences. Um, we are we are running out of time. I could I could talk to you three honestly for goddamn seventeen hours. Um, I would like to know, like this is basically like our last question. Um, but I'd like to know what release was like, and sometimes like we we walk out of prison with a lot of trauma and we carry that hurt and it doesn't always just go away right away. It doesn't go away because we're free. Um, sometimes we stay active and we take that anger out on these motherfuckers and we keep fighting them. Um, until all these doors are open. So I would just like to hear about what your release was like and what your freedom has been like since being released, what you're doing, um, what you're experiencing, just just all of that. Um, it's an open question, but take just all the time you need, please, to tell me about what your releases were like, if you've had trauma and how you worked through it, and then what you've been doing since being free. Um, Nicole, if you want to jump us out. Yeah, um, release was... So I didn't get halfway house time. So I'm going to throw that out there. I didn't get any. And it wasn't, and I, I never was told why. Um, basically, it was, you get out July 18th, that's it. And I was like, well, what about halfway house time? Oh, the beds are full. Which was, like, so I got out um, straight to my house right away. It was on a Friday. I was thankful because I didn't have to talk it, or I didn't have to check in with my CO until Monday. So I had the weekend. Ooh. Yeah, which was really nice. Um, but I got out and I I isolated myself, to be honest. I I didn't talk, I mean, obviously like my welcome, like my welcome home, everyone was there, but like I isolated myself. I was angry at I was angry. I was definitely angry, but I was also angry like uh at a lot of stuff went down with my case and my co-defendant. I, I stopped talking to my co-defendant before I was sentenced and, um, and yeah, so there's a lot of anger and a lot of hurt and a lot of understanding with the animal rights movement in that, um, there was still support for him after my release statement was out for him, him and after another person came out with a release statement and I was just angry at the animal rights movement in general, just because, and this is where I, I isolated a lot more when it came to that movement is because how can you support people who are doing this for sentient beings? And when they're talking and coming out and saying, this is all the trauma I endured from this person. And you're like, yeah, but it's okay because they, they helped animals. I was, I was out, I was done. I was like, simulator. I will not, I'm good. Um, so I isolated myself a lot and I kind of did my own, like, I, I didn't have therapy. I didn't have like, um, someone connected with, so I, I had a job, got into that. I had a CEO that was one well, my first CEO was okay, honestly. And, um, kind of let me do my thing, checked in with me when he could, and he was just like, okay, do your thing. Um, and I just, I isolated. I didn't want to talk to people or not that I didn't want to talk to people. I talked to the people that were close to me, but I like, the friendships I created when I had letter writings and everything, like when I was in, I, I kind of just dropped the ball on it. I was like, I just want to understand what I went through in a movement that I thought supported me, but only supported me in a way that I didn't, like, they didn't want to almost know what happened. They're like, okay, we're good, but you know, keep that for something else. So I kind of felt that way. And so, yeah, that's, that's how it was post-release for me. I just kind of, yeah, isolated myself a little bit. What are you doing now? How do you feel now? Um, I'm feeling more connected than I have been in a long time. So thank you. I appreciate being here. Um, I now yeah. I'm more focused on abolition and, and uh, like doing uh, work in, I guess, borders. That's my goal in life. And like, that's where I'm like seeing my focus is honestly border work. It's it it needs to crumble so yeah that's where i'm at or uh where you're at right now are are you comfortable you have a home like you got a job like your life feels yeah. all right feels good yeah i'm like i'm in a spot where i'm you know 
very comfortable and very supported and the people around me very much support me and I love them. And I, you know, this is, this is what, I, you know, but it took me a while to work around to it because after prison and especially with that, I didn't trust anybody. And especially with what happened after that. And when I was working through, when there's a lot of trauma that happened with my co-defendant and me and nobody knew. And I kept that so secretive because I was like, I don't want to hamper their support. And so I was just like, and so when the person came out and they're like, you support this person? I was like, absolutely fucking not. No, I do not. Like, I do not. And with my, 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 all my, like my amazing support team, they're like, we're on it. Don't worry. We've got this for you. And I want to give up hugs to everyone because they were amazing and they supported me and I felt the love every minute. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm good now and I'm okay to talk about it now. But for a while it was like, I'm angry. I'm super angry. Nicole, I love you, dude. I'm so happy. <laughs> you're I'm so happy you're free. Um, For anyone listening, uh, any of the viewers, when Nicole got released, she took what was left of her commissary money and distributed it amongst some of us. And I was at a time where I could not afford phone calls at that time. And Nicole's money came and I was able to talk to my wife because of Nicole. And that's why I started crying just in while you were talking. I was like, you didn't deserve this bullshit, dude. Like, you didn't deserve these people to treat you that way. Like, you are amazing. I'm just so thankful for you. Sorry for getting all emotional. I'm sorry. Um, Laura, please tell me your stories about being released and what you've been involved in. And like, if there was trauma, please. If if there was joy, please. Just what you went through when you were released and what you're doing now. Yeah, Nicole, I am so sorry you went through that. I don't know anything about it. And I want to say about our movements and especially the political prisoner movement, ignoring trauma especially when it's inflicted by people that we think are heroes, will kill us faster than anything else. And that goes for sexual predation within the movement. And it goes for any of us being cruel to each other and not supportive, a lot of shit like that. So, But I always say I am the luckiest person in the world. I went to prison, I had faced 78 years for a variety of reasons involved with some legal stuff and some the cops did a total the FBI did a totally illegal search of the apartment where Linda and Marilyn and I lived and a lot of stuff I ended up with only tw what 23 years and then because of the sentencing structures then I mean not sentencing the uh prison computation structures I only did like a little more than 14 I met because she came in to interview me, Linda, Marilyn, and Susan. I met Susie Day. We fell in love. She stuck with me, even though I was a butthead in many ways. And we won't talk about that now. She can talk about that if she wants when she's on. Oh, um, well, she will. And I got out and she was waiting for me. I have a totally supportive sister. I had we had built a lot of support, which then we had to struggle to make sure that the support and the awareness of political prisoners that came because we were white anti-imperialists would still function in building the support for all of the Black and Puerto Rican political prisoners who were still in. But I got to do that with some amazing people who, if I started naming them, we'd be here all night. But um and then I, because of the AIDS work we had done, and this was Linda's idea, she suggested that I try to get a job at Paz Magazine. And I did as an intern at like $8 an hour in the beginning. And uh, I stayed there for, I can't remember how many years, but brought a consciousness of people in prison with HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C to that magazine, was able to just, they're wonderful people. Um, helped them be aware of and start work against HIV criminalization laws, which was very fulfilling to me that they were able to do that, a lot of stuff like that. And then my old comrade and Linda's Kathy Boudin and our dear uh, lawyer, Marilyn's lawyer, um, Sophia Elijah, 
And I met Mujahid Farid when he got out of prison after he'd done 33 years on a 15 to life because of parole denials. And we started release aging people in prison. And um, because I said that thing about jailhouse lawyers before, but because Farid was a brilliant jailhouse lawyer, we didn't do legislation. We did regulation. We got in there and changed regulations. We pressured the governor to appoint different commissioners and stuff. And so we were able to contribute to the success of all of the New York state political prisoners who were in then um, getting out on parole and clemency. And I remember that I used to say to Susie, you know, we, because rap doing a community-based organization is not an easy thing. People who come into it, all the the family members of incarcerated people have enormous trauma in their lives, enormous problems. You know, I mean, I yeah, and um, and it's exhausting and it's tiring and it's it's sad and stuff. And I was old. And I said to Susie, you know, if we could just get Herman out, because we had become such good friends, if we could just get Herman out, if we could just get David out, if we could just get Seth out, if we could just get Jaleel out, I can retire. So they're all out and I'm still in it because I actually love it so much, even though it's such a struggle. Um, and so we've been going now for, this is our 11th year, working, unfortunately, from all of us, Kathy, and Farid have both died. Um, but we we have a an organization of a lot of women and femmes who were isolated before they found rap because some of them they were told because this is we we deal with people with life sentences. We deal with people who um are the quote hard cases that most of the movement when we started wouldn't touch the people with life sentences, people with homicide, people who you can't say, oh, all they did was, you know, it was just, they really needed money. So they sold a bag of dope and stuff. No, this was, this is murders. Um, and um, it has been some of the most fulfilling work of my life. And the fact that we are, I believe, raising the ability to abolish the prison system, all of us together, is magnificent. And it's discouraging. And, you know, it's obviously not happening next year, but um, I love it. And I don't know, I get to, and I still get to work with Linda because we're, we have something called death by incarceration is torture. So that's where I'm at. And I am the luckiest person in the world because I did what I wanted to do. Um, I did time for it. I was, you have to be in prison, sucks. But if you have to be in prison and you're in prison with the people that Linda and I named before, including Apple, Nadine Farris, and, um, and uh, Ida and everyone, you know, Hamdia, then you're a very fortunate person. So, but I can't say I've kicked the trauma. I do. I mean, I think part of my freaking out every fucking day and I go to every demonstration I can, but about what Israel is doing and the United States supporting it so frontally, part of my visceral reaction to that comes from what I talked about before, about that sense of when you, all of a sudden you realize you have no power to defend yourself in that moment. And um, every time we hear about, you know, another bombing or the rape of prisoners, and I just wanna say one thing about Palestine since I'm talking about it, and this was true when Susie and I were on that, that delegation we talked about, Palestinians, the Palestinian movement supports their political prisoners full force, but they don't do it as a series of individuals. They don't, you don't hear people talk about, oh, the sacrifice that this person made or this person. That's why I, I react to the, uh, when people talk about political prisoners as heroes or whatever. In Palestine, support for political prisoners is an occasion to expose the nature of the genocidal Zionist regime. 
and the resistance to it and the fact that people under those incredibly horrible conditions and where settlements, settlers just go hog wild on the Palestinian people whose homes they are stealing. All of that, that level of brutality is still, people are capable of resisting and they do and they are. And um, that's what the promotion of the issue of free our political prisoners is in Palestine. And I feel like for us, that has to be it too. So I like to hear, I like us to talk more about how we resist than how we suffered, even though I think that has to be talked about too, because it exposes the system. But anyway, that's, yeah. Oh, Another just great. Oh. about how we use the trauma, because this was taught to me by someone on one of our trips, our advocacy trips. We talk to the legislators and people talk about their experiences in prison and talk about being strip searched all the time, talk about their children being taken away. And afterwards we come together and we sort of hold each other and sometimes people cry. And there was a rabbi in one of the groups I was in one time and she said, I really respect you all for re-traumatizing yourselves for the sake of justice. And I thought, oh, that really says it perfectly. So that's what we do. It's really beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Linda, if you could talk about your release, any traumas you suffer still or then, um, what you've been up to since then, and just how your life is doing, I would really love to hear it, please. Well, uh, like Laura, I was, I feel like I'm the luckiest person in the world sometimes, you know, like so I'm privileged, right now. so privileged. I feel privileged because it's been raining for <laughs> three days here, like pouring rain and I'm warm and dry. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people in our town and our county and our country that are, you know, freezing. <laughs> um, but my release, you know, was sudden because I uh, had put in a clemency petition to the president, like many, many, many people do in the federal system. And uh, I got released, I got a presidential clemency. So I was released suddenly. And I will tell the story of how that happened. My lawyer, Debbie Katz, uh, a lesbian, knew the owner of the women's bookstore in Washington, D.C. That owner of the bookstore also knew the lesbian chief of staff for President Clinton and brokered a phone call between Debbie and the chief of staff. They talked for, Debbie said, over, over an hour. And at the end uh, of the conversation, Debbie said that the conversation went so well. The woman said, I'm going to put, put the petition, you know, on the top of the pile, whatever that means. And, she, and, she, and Debbie had to say, you know, she was uh, convicted of bombing the Capitol. <laughs> and the woman said that won't be a problem. So, you know, hey, uh, so we received word, my, my partner, Eve, who I also had fallen in love with, who visited me um, because of a series of odd <laughs> circumstances. Um, she received a phone call from somebody that saw it in the newspaper. And so Eve heard it. I called Eve in the morning and, and, she, and <laughs> She said, well, I said, well, what? <laughs> I didn't know about it. And she said, uh, you're getting released today. And I said, um, don't, you know, I'm, I'm good. I had just talked to my friend, uh, Brenda, who was in the, had a life sentence and it was a Native American in the Four Winds Club. She said, every year I learned something new. And that's how she did her time. And so I'm like, I'm going to learn, you know, I have this good, attitude here because 
we had expected to hear something maybe, you know, and here I was there, it happened. And so people were in the visiting room with visiting Marilyn and took me to Oakland. I, I mean, it was very, very shocking. Oh. It was shocking. And um, Eve drove up from Los Angeles where she was living. And, you know, I had about a month in Oakland and then got my parole transferred to Los Angeles and moved in with her. And our relationship has managed to survive all this time. We're married, so I'm really, really lucky. Um, I will say that after, uh, when I, when we lived in Los Angeles, we moved because I saw a listing on the Black Radical Congress website or something about, uh, a job at the Center for Third World Organizing, which I was mostly people of color. I thought, oh, that'd be a good place to work. And it turned out that. It was for a uh, to defend a, a, a grant that had been written to the Soros Foundation for, for a fellowship. And I received the fellowship and that money enabled me to live and to be part of organizing and starting All of Us or None. And that effort was very, very important. I think that it's critical that we have been organizing formerly incarcerated people to believe that we have power and the power to change things. Um, we started a campaign that I, uh, has affected uh, formerly incarcerated people, people with convictions uh, in many of the states, I think a majority of the states now, called Ban the Box, that eliminated the question have you been convicted of whatever, a crime by a court uh, from the employment and housing and uh, student loan applications? So that was a very big deal. The initial applications by law can no longer have that question in both public and private employment in some places. And so um, I think that was important work. Now I'm doing a lot of work with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners around life without parole sentences and trying to eliminate LWAP in California. And like Laura was saying, it's extremely rewarding work to be with people that have shared the kinds of experiences and traumas that we have and to work with their families um, we've tried a variety of approaches and have not been successful getting our legislation through, but we have been somewhat successful in some of the resentencing efforts that we're making. So it, it's a process, but we have a statewide coalition. Awesome. And I, I just wanted to say that I think what we have to look out for now is a real increase in construction of prisons and the filling up of prisons because of mass deportation, which is going to start happening. Mm -hmm. And the private prisons are poised to make a profit like they have never made before because they are the ones that are going to be tasked with building these detention camps. And I think it's gonna be critical for all of us to pay attention to this construction and to oppose it every single place that we can because the immigrants that are being locked up are our friends, our family, our neighbors, people that we work with. And, you know, that is going to be, I think, the point of the spear for, for the Trump administration. He's going to start it right away. He's got his people in place. They're evil, evil people, and they don't care if families are separated, if children are ripped from mother's arms, they don't, they don't care, they like it. So I feel very, very strongly about the need for everybody to come out and, you know, 
oppose the construction of those prisons and build the community structures that we need to protect people, you know? And this is not just people from Mexico or Latin America. This is people from Africa, from Haiti, from Palestine. And it's incumbent upon us who know what the prison system is like to act, to oppose the construction and really build those, build the solidarity, build the love that we can share with people. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to just thank you, all three of you. Um, this, this has been probably my favorite talk I've ever done. <laughs> it was just really inspiring. And I hope everyone listening understands that like, we can do this. Like we can fight this fight. And we have people that have been talking to you that, that are still doing it despite all they've been through and despite how much the world has changed, like they're still fighting and finding ways to fight. And please let that motivate you. Um, I always end by encouraging people to write prisoners. My wife wrote me in prison and that's how we met. And we are still together 11 years later. Um, yeah. So this book came together because Josh Davidson wrote me in prison and we became friends. Um, and that's why I get to talk to you all now. And so please, like it, it won't just change their life. It might just, it might change your life. It might change the world. So please write a prisoner. Um, and just thank you all so much. Liberty, you can close this out, friend. Liberty might have bounced. <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> Eric and Josh. It's and been an Liberty. incredible conversation. You did a good job. Thank you. I, I had almost nothing to do. Y'all did it all. It was incredible. It was such a beautiful conversation. Um, I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you for the extra time. Thank too. you. I love all three of you so much. Thank you all. Good night, Thank folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.